Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the best books that I've read so far in 2022, starting with Jane Austen's Mansfield Park. Mansfield Park is Jane Austen's third novel, and it's often seen as one of her most polarising novels as well. It tells the story of Fanny Price, who is, unlike most Austen heroines, a shy, retiring girl who is adopted by her aunt and uncle, and she lives with them in a kind of denigrated state. She's seen as a family member, but they kind of treat her a bit like a servant. Uh, and she basically follows her life as she grows up, and she finds herself surrounded by many corrupt characters, and throughout the corruption that she's surrounded by, Fanny has to stick to her virtue and her sincerity. I can see why this isn't Jane Austen's you know, favourite novel among a lot of readers. It lacks the humour, um, or at least the extreme humour of, say, Pride and Prejudice. Some of the satire is a bit more subtle, although you do have characters like Aunt Norris, who is one of Fanny's aunts, who is a <laughs> horrible, a horrible woman, but a great parody of a horrible, snobbish woman. Um, so you have her. You also have other characters and just little moments of humour, but it is a bit more of a serious novel. It does have a more sombre feel, and I'm not going to lie, on my first read, I didn't enjoy it all that much, but when I listened to it the second time, I really enjoyed it and found a lot to appreciate. Fanny Price is a very complex heroine. She might not be vivacious and brash and witty, uh, but she does have integrity, and when it counts, she has strength. Yeah, she puts up with a lot, but when push comes to shove, she's able to stand up for her morals. So she is still a strong character, just a different kind of strength. What I also like about Mansfield Park is the moral ambiguity of the story. Unlike Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice, where there are clearer morals to be learned from the stories, Mansfield Park is kind of ambiguous. Yes, you have Fanny who is, you know, seen as virtuous and she has a happy ending, but she's also a bit prudish and sometimes as a reader you think maybe she is a bit too much of the prude. And then you have the Crawfords, who are the more uh, modern family, if you like. Uh, they are more world-weary, their morals are a bit more ambiguous, but they're also very tempting. And sometimes it seems like Austin is kind of enchanted by them as well. And I like that. I like that there's this tension between what the Crawfords are as people and what Fanny is as a person. And it's not obvious to me that there is a clear moral in Mansfield Park. There are certainly moral themes, but it, it's just a much more ambiguous story, and that's something that I really enjoyed and it's definitely a book that I'm going to come back to and one that I think I might actually dig deeper in uh, on the channel very soon. Moving away from the classics for my next favourite book and this is Anne Rice's Blood and Gold which is either the sixth or seventh, well I don't actually know the number, but it's one of the books in her Vampire Chronicles series. Blood and Gold tells the story of Marius who is a vampire whose history goes all the way back to ancient Greece and it tells his story all the way from then all the way up to the present day. I was starting to flag with the Vampire Chronicles series, I have to <laughs> have to admit. I really enjoyed the Mayfair Witches series by Anne Rice, I really enjoyed the early novels of the Vampire Chronicles, but after reading the Tales of the New Vampires and reading Merrick, uh, I, was, I was just kind of getting a bit, you know, wearied of, of the Vampire Chronicles. But with this novel, I think Rice just really gets back in her stride with everything. Blood and Gold is, she's, with Blood and Gold, she's able to combine her great character work. Marius is a fantastic character. He's very complex, he's very interesting, he has a very interesting story. And she's able to combine this with her philo philosophizing and her love of history and art, which is imbued throughout this story. I think at one point Marius even has an infatuation with Botticelli and considers making him a vampire. And I think this is the first book where, or well, not the first, but it's one of the books where Rice is really able to synthesize these things that she loves. One of my issues with, uh, say, Pandora, and even Vittorio to a lesser extent, is that it really felt like Rice had gone away, learned some stuff about some periods in history, and now she just wanted to kind of, you know, tell a story in that world, but she really was focusing more on the history and less on the novel. Whereas I feel like with Blood and Gold, she really does focus on the actual story, the actual character of Marius, his journey, his interactions with other vampires, his lost love, Pandora, they actually have an interesting relationship in this book, more so than in the actual story of Pandora, where her relationship with Marius is kind of glossed over. Also, his relationship to the Queen of the Damned, Akasha, that gets fleshed out a lot, and it's just fantastic. She, she explores, she manages to explore new things within this world, and it doesn't feel like anything's redundant. And like I say, she's able to combine all the things that make Anne Rice great, and it did get me back on track with the with Vampire Chronicles. That being said, I've actually not read uh, any more of Vampire Chronicles since that book, and that's mainly because I've been doing my Jane Austen uh, read-throughs. I'm almost done now, so I think very soon I'll be able to get onto the next Vampire Chronicles book and continue the read-through the series. 
Next up we have Sons and Lovers by D.H. Lawrence and along with Austin, D.H. Lawrence is definitely going to be up there with the best new writers that I've engaged with this year. I absolutely loved Sons and Lovers, I think it is a fantastic book. It tells the story of Paul Morell, who is a, I think he's the youngest uh, son or middle, middle son in a working class family with a minor as a father and a mother who was of a higher class but she kind of married down and lives to, <laughs> lives to regret that. Uh, and now she lives through her sons and she lives through Paul and although he loves his mother dearly, uh, she is a kind of smothering mother uh, and she interferes with his love life and his development into a man uh, in terms of his mental maturity but also his sexuality. It also explores his relationships with two key women in his life. The more modern, one of them, I can't remember the names now, uh, one of them is a more modern woman and the other one is more conservative uh, and he has very different relationships with these two women and the shadow of his mother is lingering behind all of it. I just felt like this was an absolutely amazing book. Lawrence just has a lot of depth when it comes to creating complex characters. The relationship with Paul and his mother is disturbing at times, but also endearing at times and tragic ultimately. Even other themes in the background like Paul's relationship with his father. His father could easily be portrayed as, you know, the working class, gruff, drunk alcoholic, abusive man. And he is to some extent those things. but. Lawrence doesn't just kind of treat him like that. He treats him with just as much sympathy as the other characters. He sees him as part of a broken world and a broken family. And I like that there's that element of empathy with all of the characters in the story. Although this is my favorite Lawrence novel, that isn't stopping another Lawrence novel from making it into the list, Lady Chatterley's Lover. Lady Chatterley's Lover was a very controversial novel when it first appeared because it depicted very graphically uh, the sexual relationships uh, that Lady Chatterley has with a young uh, groundskeeper, I don't know if he's very young actually, but with her groundskeeper. She's married to a nobleman who is paralysed in a wheelchair, they have a very unsatisfactory marriage because of this, and she uh, starts to have a sexual relationship with uh, the groundskeeper. And the story really gets in <laughs> into the sexual stuff, and I was actually quite surprised because you know, sometimes when a text is older, even if it's got a reputation for controversy, controversy you sometimes feel like, you know, it's not going to live up to modern standards. And in a sense, it doesn't. It's, you know, it's stuff that you would find in any modern book that has sex in it. Uh, but but when you put that in the context of the time, you can certainly see why this would have, would have caused a stir. Again, like with Sons and Lovers, I think Lawrence does a really good job of empathising with his characters. For example, uh, Lady Chesley's husband uh, could be just played as this resentful, bitter man. He, he was kind of a, he was in the, in the war, that's when he lost his, uh, was paralysed, and since then he's become kind of bitter and pathetic. Um, and it would, again, it would be quite easy to just portray him as a pathetic, weak villain, and in many ways he, <laughs> you know, he's not a very nice uh, person, but Lawrence takes the time to build empathy with with that character. I also think the way he explores female sexuality and just sexuality in general is really impressive in this book just in terms of how far he takes it uh, and also just the kind of private conversations that Lady Chatterley has with her husband. Even before the stuff with the groundskeeper happens, the husband says to her that you know if she wants to uh, you know, get sexual gratification elsewhere she can and he even suggests that she could have a child by another man and they would just pretend that it was that it was his. So there's lots of interesting stuff. Another thing that I found interesting about the story is kind of its broader uh, themes of industrialization and the kind of falling of the gentry because obviously Lady Chatterley's husband is a, is a uh, man uh, with a title and he's paralyzed and useless and impotent whereas the working class uh, rugged groundskeeper and Lady Chatterley herself are sort of on the rise in the story through their relationship and eventual union at the end of the story. Again, a great book. Uh, I definitely will be reading more Lawrence. Maybe after I've done with Austin, he might be the next uh, author that I just tackle all of their works and go through because uh, I definitely want to read more of Lawrence. Moving away from the classics and into something a little bit more trashy for the, for the next one, uh, this is Flowers in the Attic by V.C. Andrews. Now, this is a book where I watched the film when I was reasonably young because my mum loves this film. Uh, or at least she, she liked it. I don't know if she loved it, but whatever. Uh, and one of the, it was one of those films that maybe it's just kind of that gothic aesthetic kind of stuck with me. I was also terrified of horror films when I was a kid, so anything even slightly scary uh, would, you know, stick in my head. But I never actually read the, read the books uh, until this year when I finally read the whole Dollenganger series by V.C. Andrews. 
The Dolan Ganget series follows four children uh, initially, uh, and in the first book, they their father dies, their mother takes them to live with their grandparents, uh, and she's previously been exiled by these grandparents for something unknown that she did in the past. And they go to the grandmothers and find themselves locked in the attic, where they have to stay until their grandfather dies, because apparently if he finds out that Corinne, the mother, had children, then she wouldn't inherit, so they wouldn't get the money that they need. Uh, I really in enjoyed this book. I think it's, <laughs> in a sense, it's not a good book in the sense that the dialogue is very stilted, the writing style is bizarre and strange, and it's not obvious to me that it's necessarily a good writing style, but it's just the kind of book that just keeps your interest going. And I don't think it's just because of the shock value, you know, the fact that uh, two of the siblings share an incestuous relationship, uh, among other things that happen in the book and the series as a whole is quite shocking. It's just Andrew's prose style is kind of gripping and strange. Uh, you can tell this is a woman who has sort of been isolated from the world a little bit uh, and has some pretty strange ideas. And I think that's what draws, at least that's what draws me into the story, especially with the first book. I feel like as a, as a, as a series, I think it gets a bit worse as it goes on. I think it might have been better actually in a sense to end the story, the first book, in a satisfying way. Um, or even just end it as it ended, sort of this open-ended uh, way that it did. Because I do think that it tells, a complete, in a sense, a complete story. Uh, and some of the later books just get it. They, they veer too much into the side of trash. <laughs> but nevertheless, I, I do think it's a very interesting book. And I certainly enjoyed uh, taking a break from all the Austin uh, and digging into this. So it was a good book. Now we have what might be the best thing that I've read this year. It was certainly the book that had the most immediate impact on me. And that is Dante's The Divine Comedy. I had to do a lot of long, very long drives up and down the UK this year, and so for some of those drives I listened to The Divine Comedy, and I was just completely blown away, especially by The Inferno, which is the first part of the story where Dante goes all the way down through hell, through all the circles of hell, and experiences so many tortures, so many trials, and is able to come out on the other side into Purgatory, which is the second part of the story, and then more trials, and then we finally get to Paradiso, heaven, for the third part of the this huge sprawling poem. And I was just completely blown away by this. Uh, for the whole drive, I took very few breaks, I just wanted to get through it, as much of it <laughs> as possible in that drive. Uh, and I managed to get, I think it was all the way till about halfway through Paradiso, and I was so entranced by it that I actually then, when I got back home, started reading it uh, as well alongside finishing the audiobook because it just blew me away. Uh, the imagination of, of Dante in this, in this poem is just beyond belief. Uh, just the detail in terms of the, all the circles of hell, every stage of purgatory, all of the strange, more abstract, weird stuff that happens in the, in the Paradiso. Um, everything about, about this poem uh, I, I just found absolutely amazing, uh, even when I wasn't exactly sure what was going on. You know, I've, I've heard people saying that it's really hard to understand um, the Divine Comedy without like a, a degree in history uh, so that you get all the references and things. But I, I didn't find this, I mean I don't know anything uh, really about Dante before reading this aside from the fact that he wrote this. Uh, and, and I didn't find it too difficult to engage with a lot of what was going on. Just the images uh, that he creates, just the scenes, just the language, obviously it's a translation but still uh, it's all there uh, to enjoy and yeah I was completely blown away by this and it's it's something that I definitely want to explore more in the in the future. And again, if I ever get to the point where I where I have the level of in, of knowledge to do it, it would be interesting to really dig deep into into the Divine Comedy because I think there's just so much that you could say, and it's definitely worth engaging with and reading over and over again. And last on the list, we have another audiobook that I listened to most of on one of these long drives, and that is *The Idiot* by Dostoevsky. The Idiot tells the story of an epileptic young man called Mushkin who has spent most of his life outside of Russia in Switzerland under the medical care and guidance of a benevolent doctor. And at the start of the story he returns to Russia and meets a kind of shadow character to himself called Rogozhin. And he then finds himself in Russia surrounded by some very nasty uh, and always broken people. Uh, and he finds himself surrounded by these people. But Mushkin uh, is uh, completely naive and bright and you know, he's like a beacon of light amongst all of this corruption to the point where a lot of these characters when they first meet him they think he's too good to be true they think there's something dodgy going on because how could someone be so sort of nice and, and uh, you know friendly uh, and 
The story doesn't really have so much of a plot, in the sense it more just focuses on Mushkin's interactions in these various corrupt circles. I think what I enjoyed most about this book are the character sketches. Every single character just stands out in your mind as you're reading it, and you can recall them, you know, just by thinking of the book after you've read it. I would also say it's more comedic, say, than Crime and Punishment, which is the only other Dostoevsky that I've read, but it still has an edge to it. It still has a darkness, and in a way, the conclusion to The Idiot is even darker than anything in Crime and Punishment, and also I really wasn't expecting the conclusion to be what it was, so I won't spoil it there for you. But a fantastic book. Uh, I think Dostoevsky didn't necessarily rate it as one of his uh, technically best, I think in part because he wasn't sure himself where he was going with it at times, but it really doesn't read like that. Even though, like I say, it doesn't have a concrete plot, the characters are bright enough and the interactions between them are interesting enough to just keep your attention all the way through. So a fantastic book and I, and I can't recommend it enough. All right, so that's it for my list of the best things that I've read so far this year. Let me know down in the comments what great books you have read so far this year and also what have you got coming up in the pipeline? What do you think? will end up being your favourite books that you've read for the rest of the year as well. As always, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to the channel. Otherwise, take care everyone. I'll see you all in the next video. Ta-ra!